and welcome to this Maritime London webinar. I'm Joss Standerwick, Chief Executive of Maritime London. Uh, and in a slight break from the norm this Friday afternoon, we won't be discussing sanctions or uh, EU emissions trading schemes, tonnage tax or anything, I suppose, directly shipping related. But I suppose in my mind, something far more, far more interesting. Um, it's not every day you get to speak to England's uh, top ever test try scorer or even a fast jet pilot, and I suppose even rarer, uh, that they manifest themselves in one individual. Um, but anyway, we have Rory Underwood here with us today, um, who in his rugby, I, I, I'm not going to go through in great deal his biography, because I fear we'll take up the whole uh, allotted hour. Um, but after some brief housekeeping, we'll get into exploring how Rory's experiences uh, both in the RAF and on the rugby pitch has informed his business consultancy, focusing on optimising the performance of teams in the workplace. Um, we do have a Q&A function uh, and I'd ask you to put the questions in the Q&A, not in the chat, because I'm a, I'm a Luddite and can't manage having more than one window open at any, uh, any one time. Uh, so if you do have questions, put them in the Q&A function and we'll either bring them into the, the discussion as we go, or we will send, you know, spend a few minutes at the end uh, asking any questions that you may have. Uh, I think Rory is relatively open to questions, not only in terms of what he's doing now, uh, but in terms of his uh, previous careers as well. Uh, so we'll see how many we can get through at the at the end of the session. Um, I think the last point to make is this session is being recorded. Uh, a recording of the session will go out to all of those who have signed up today. Uh, and will also be put on the uh, Maritime London YouTube channel. So Rory, without any further ado, it's great to have you here today uh, and, and thanks for making the time. Absolutely, pleasure, Joss. Really pleased to be here. Uh, that's great. And I, you know, we've, we haven't got long and I know that you've got a lot to say. Uh, so we'll, we'll get cracking, right? And, and so I think to start off with, um, you know, I have a relatively stressful job and i and i emphasize relatively um you played top flight rugby yeah uh, uh, largely in the amateur period but you also also did segue into the professional era um you were a fast jet pilot and i think it's fair to say they are both intensely high pressure environments right and i think my first question would be do you feel that spinning both of those plates concurrently was beneficial or, or detrimental to, to those pursuits? Oh, that's an interesting question, the way you've asked it. Because um, I do get asked a lot, the whole context of how did I manage to uh, combine the two? I mean, the first thing to say, um, in, in putting some clarity, because um, there's obviously some people on, on uh, the webinar who may not um, be a rugby aficionados, is that the game only turned professional in 95. So, and the, as you said, the bulk of my career was during the amateur era. So the best way of describing it is, was my day job, I was a part of the Royal Air Force. I, I turned up at eight o'clock for Met Brief, I flew till five, night flying, the odd weekends, these attachments, but fundamentally, um, metaphorically speaking, it was a nine to five job. Um, I had a hobby, I played rugby, you know, from school, uh, leaving school, joining a club at Middlesbrough, then, then when I joined the Air Force, moved down to Leicester Tigers. Um, and in those days, because of an amateur game, I was training Tuesdays and Thursday nights uh, and playing on a Saturday. Virtually most most games were three o'clock Saturday afternoons. They had an odd midweek game, but fundamentally it was three o'clock on a Saturday. So that, that's that's the best way to go. My job was uh, being a part of the Royal Air Force and my hobby was playing rugby, albeit, as you've alluded to, the odd game on a Saturday would be at Twickenham in front of 65, 70,000 people. Yeah. Um, and you know the height of it and just to um you know not seeing from a rooftop thing but you know during the 90s when england were at their, their peak during that that will carling you know era uh we won three grand slams five championships we got to a world cup final that was a really successful period of english rugby uh and so between that time from 90 until 96 when i retired from england that last six years of my career the last half of my career um both my daughters, but one was born in 90, one was born in 91. And just to add to that, you know, I was doing all that. Plus I had two kids under the age of five or six during that period as well. Um, so yes, the, the, 
their intent intense in their own right but they were separated it wasn't as if there was you know uh on top of each other all the time um and i suppose the way i've always looked at it has always been you know if you get stressed at work there's nothing better than to get out into the rugby pitch and run around and you know not that i was the most physical um person but you know bumping and bumping around and that physicality you could if you had any frustrations that's one way of getting out of it but getting out and and you know um blowing the cobwebs out of your lungs and sweating and all that sort of stuff was a nice way of getting um you know all that off you but then at times you know sometimes the drudgery because when i was training because of where i was flying and where i was living uh, at home for the whole of my rugby career from when i started as a kid up in middlesbrough and living in barney castle until I retired, I never drove less than an hour uh, to any training session. So I either finished work and I jumped in the car and I drove an hour, hour, 15 minutes, to drive up to Leicester, wherever I was stationed at. Um, and then I had to drive home. So I'd get home at 10, 10, 10 30 o'clock at night. Uh, and then invariably I was up at six, um, you know, uh, get yourself sorted out, jump in the car, normally an hour to, to, to my, my base. And I was at Met Brief at eight o'clock. Um, and if, if, if you think about triumvirately, then you've got the element of, you know, if you think everything's really tough and really bad, and then you come home and obviously you get deposited with a two year old that's screaming its head off and a <laughs> six month old that's just been sick everywhere, it sort of puts things in perspective. So I always look at it as sort of rather than all three things on top of each other, there were there were different elements of that. And and it don't be wrong, it was a challenge, you know, and Christ, you know, uh bless her love of the bits, because you know, if it wasn't for my wife, I wouldn't have been able to cope with that anyway. Um, so it's, it was always a question of, um, rather than being concerned about how each of them were piling on each other, I always used them as a way of relieving the other side, if that makes yeah. sense. Yeah. And I suppose that goes to, goes down to, to, well, it, first it sounds as if they were largely complementary, uh, I suppose, and, and maybe we'll get into this in a bit later, but the team building ethos that was uh i suppose omnipresent in both of those sectors of your life probably complemented each other uh but largely uh, 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 a a time management exercise more than anything yes. else and using your time effectively which i suppose there are some lessons that you've then learned in terms of your professional career your business career as well yeah i mean time management to a certain extent there's obviously priorities and there's elements of you know training was always set on a Tuesdays and Thursday night and matches. And then if, if you're playing for England, you knew what the days were off. So the management of time was, was sort of fairly sort of formulaic because for all the rugby that tends to be set in, 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 in not quite stone, but you know, fairly rigidly, uh, the flying, the air force were brilliant. You know, they basically just, uh, made sure that all the, um, and this was unbeknownst to me, but you know, I learned later on, but as I went through my, my Air Force career and for every station, every squadron I was posted onto, the squadron boss, the station commander, they were all very well aware of, you know, who I was and what I'm um, doing both as a, a pilot, but also as a, uh, as a, as a rugby player. And, you know, it was made very clear, make it as easy for Underwood to do what he needs to do, make his life sure. easy to be able to, uh, you know, ease, ease any issues that there are. Um, and, you know, at the time, it just seemed to be, you know, things just seemed to happen. And in, but in hindsight, not in hindsight, but when you learned about all these sort of stuff, you realise what was being paved the way. So the biggest thing that I always take about, the biggest thing that I always talk about, um, it's not so much the time management per se, but it's, it's linked, but it's about communication. Yeah. And the one thing I learned very early on was if there's anything, if there's any situations, any uh, issues, anything you need to do, is that things change or something happens, you need to you communicate it as soon as possible you know uh the last thing my missus wanted was to be so oh sorry i've got to go away for the next two three days because i've got to go and play this you didn't tell me and of course you know all well, that's for stuff the air force as long as the air force knew what my playing schedule was they could plan around it etc etc so you know you know when i've got a a six week or an, an you know one tour in the lines in 89 i was away from work for 10 weeks yeah uh, down in australia so um you know the sooner they knew what was going on the better it was um and so even if it was good news or if it was bad news as soon as you tell the bad news by the time it gets to it it calms down the last thing you want to do is give bad news the last minute yeah yeah but uh, Roy, i'm going to be honest I, I i think you're being quite modest you know uh speaking from experience 
uh, most amateur sports people, as soon as they start their professional lives, you know, the extracurricular activities start dropping off, etc. And you obviously do have uh, some aptitude for managing multiple high pressure environments, I think it's fair to say. And, and what I'd like to sort of explore a little bit is how you took those lessons in terms of how you manage those environments uh, and put them into a business environment. Well, I suppose I've always, you know, my, my passion is, is, is teams about how yeah. the whole dynamics of how a group of, I mean, I, I always put the challenges, why is it that, you know, obviously I, I talk about this now because I've been out of the military for uh, 22 years, so I'm, I'm, I'm in business. Um, why is it that there's always a, an assumption that if there is an issue, a problem, a scenario, a project, whatever it is, that if you just throw four, five, six people at it, they will automatically work as a team. And that seems to be the default um, sort of um, methodology because it takes it takes effort, it takes time and it takes resource for a group of people to actually develop as a team. You know, for any for that team that I talked about, that success we had in the 90s, it all started two, three years beforehand uh, with Jeff Cook coming in, you know, really making clear um, you know, the, the strategy of uh, what he wants to achieve for the team and the direction it wants to go and the sort of players and various things. Picked a young captain in Will Carling at 22, 23 uh, to give some longevity. You know, in, in a couple of years before that, we had about 50 different players that got that got a game mm -hmm. during one calendar year. Part of it's tour and people can go on tour and stuff in the amateur days. But, you know, that creates no consistency. Um, and so when we won the first Grand Slam in 1991, in the four games we played, the 15 were the same 15 for all four games. Yeah. So that makes a massive difference. And so the whole context of the amount of time and effort that is put into the way as individuals, we work together in teams. And you could argue there's, there's multi little teams. You could argue from front row, you know, second row, back row, half backs, centers, back three, to then backs and forwards and into the whole team. So all those things sort of build up to create that, 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 you know, team of 15 rugby players that perform at its peak potential. So um, the whole context of that was really something that was very strong in me. And of course, in the Air Force, you understand, you know, in, 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 in sport, it's about winning and losing. Yeah. In the military, it can potentially be about life or death. You know, and, you know, in the maritime world, I'd put that in there as well. You know, some of the um, environments that you work in out in the in the um, I mean, you know, I sometimes thought, should I go and, you know, do a leg of the um, round the world yacht race? And I look at the 100 foot waves and I think, mm, yeah, do I really want to do that? You know, utmost respect for anybody who goes and does that. Um, yeah. And when it's like that, it tends to focus the mind. And, you know, as a, a professional pilot, as a as a um, somebody who was trained up by the military and given so much training, not only as an officer, but as the whole context of how we work as a team to be able to deliver. Um, you know, as as a fighting force. So, you know, I, I organized, I'd be responsible for two ships or four ships organizing uh, attacks on, on targets. We have to make sure that not only do each of us individually know how to fly, we also know how collectively as four of us flying at times very close to each other at very high speeds, obviously, we know exactly how we're supposed to operate. And that passion is what I brought to um, the outside world. And it's one of my biggest frustrations when I came out, the whole sort of context of, you know, to a certain extent, it was lip service that, um, you know, how do you measure successful teams in business? Well, I'm making money. Just because you're making money doesn't mean that you're actually, you know, a high performance team. It doesn't mean that you're getting your optimum performance out of the individuals collectively as a team. And so that's been one of my, um, real challenges over the years in, in setting my company in the first instance and trying to create a proposition and trying to get that uh, word according to Underwood out there has been that whole aspect of how to actually get the most um, release of the potential of people to give them a chance to be able to perform at the highest level. To, to probably use a bad analogy, uh, in essence, it feels like you're, you're saying it's about getting the multiple parts of the engine to work together at the same time. Now, in uh, in the RAF environment, environment or on the rubber pitch, I think the advantages of doing that are self-evident, right? Uh, and you can objectively see 
the the results in doing that and i wonder and i'll be interested to get your insights on this in the in the commercial space in the business space trying to get companies or, or employees of companies to buy into visions and ethoses etc you know can sometimes be taken as i suppose marketing speak more yeah. than, you know more than anything else because because individuals i mean you know they have their targets they have their kpis they have their objectives spending time on thinking about the bigger whole and the good of the group isn't as immediately sort of perhaps obvious to them as it is in a rugby team or as it is uh flying in the raf for example and i suppose i suppose the question to to you is that in that in that environment how do you go about getting employees to understand the importance of the whole you know the importance of working together not being siloed etc yeah. when they've got their individual pressures that they're managing at the same time yeah and of course the real um conundrum is that the issue there is as you talked about is between the tangible and the intangible yeah uh, and of course how do you measure it? how do you know whether you do any good is is much easier to do with the uh, with the tangible than it is with the intangible so therefore you've had a conundrum of you try and give that sort of um vision and hope people understand it but then how do they then connect that with what they're supposed to be doing and that mm. is that is that is a challenge for any business to do um and especially with the bigger and bigger you become as a as a as a uh as an organization because the more people you've got the more differing ways that people may interpret it think about it look at it communicate it manage it lead it whatever they just add to the whole complications of uh, of that and in some ways what you're talking about is is what i i mean I, we have three ethos in our, in our business as we as we go in and help organizations to be able to deliver on our strategy and it's around whatever we do whatever we try and help the business do we're trying to do three things one is kiss keep it simple stupid we as human beings are very good at trying to complicate things 100 percent in everything we do the second thing is as we've done before uh try to make it tangible and even with the intangible stuff the real challenge for any manager or leader uh, in organizations is to try and help create even if it's that intangible how do we make it such that it is tangible so it's something that people can get their teeth into mm. and there are ways and means of doing it um and it may take some effort, but there are ways. And the more you can do that, the easier it is for people to understand it, get it, see it, feel it, do something about it, and then obviously see whether they're actually being successful. And the final thing is being pragmatic. You know, I, I went into an organization once, and they, um, they're a big organization, but they were spending shed loads of money on this sales um, um, training program. And it was a really top-end, um, sophisticated, really you know sharp type sales uh training and actually the actual company wasn't doing that sharp end sales type stuff it mm. was more like the customer service over the counter type service and that sort of stuff where it didn't need that type of selling but it needed the sort of um the more sort of relationship type yeah. way of dealing with stuff the simple sort of stuff the sort of would you like some fries with that sir type type selling rather than that real complicated stuff um, and really a lot of people were sort of some of those that were into the sales thought it was brilliant, but those that were just more the sort of generic uh, across the board type people were just didn't understand it, couldn't understand how to actually apply it and use it. And they're wasting money and, and, and their time, so to speak. And, and I, I, I wonder if that's uh, a trend that we're increasingly seeing, you know, uh, we're, we're constantly being told that data is everything. Uh, and we're seeing all sorts of tools, um, not only in the business development environment, but in various environments within the within the business sector, to to support the collection of data to enhance your ability to sell, etc. A lot of you know platforms that are supposed to be able to support you in doing things. And I wonder if that is actually, in some cases, diverting attention from from the basics, right? You know those those core principles that you've got to be able to learn in order to do your job effectively mm. but also diverting away from that team ethos because you're you're bogged down in trying to justify your your own being rather than justify the the health of the company i suppose i suppose i always reflect back to one of my first 
uh, workshops I did when I just started becoming a consultant. One of our first was a holiday company. We were with the senior management team of the UK. And uh, we did a two day workshop in the middle of middle uh, end of the first day, towards the end of the first day, there was a knock on the door. It's getting you know, five ish, something like that. There was a knock on the door and this, this um, one of the uh, porters from the uh, concierge came and he said, uh, this is for, um, you know, um, uh, Peter, the, uh, the CEO. And it was the sort of top line level results for all of their shops around their, their um, travel agents around the country. And uh, they sort of, what, can we just, can we just look? Yeah, so we stopped, had a look at it. And they went, yeah, no, happy with that. So they put it on side and we carried on. We, you know, did another half an hour or so. And that was, that was like nine, early 2000s, like 2001, two. So emails were just about to come out, but they hadn't really settled into place. So that was mm -hmm. a fax that came in. So. So for some people who don't know what a fax is, you know. Yeah. But anyway, um, roll forward even 10 years and then 20 years to where we are now. So 20 years later, of course, you know, information is is imparted on this and it's and it's live. Yeah. It's in real time. Yeah. And what was interesting was that was they get the, the, the results for that was at the end of every day. And they look at it and thought, fine, okay. So then they won't look at it until another 24 hours later. Whereas now they can tell every second as to whether sales is up or down or any other commodity or any other um, transaction that's going on. And of course, what happens is having information or data, however you want to do it, is all useful. But like anything else, it's only useful if you know how to use it. Yeah. It's only useful if you know when to use it and then how you go about doing it. And so the, the trend I've seen over the last... 20 years as I've gone from that first situation there when that fax came into where we are now is I refer to as great as communication is as great as it's like this to have this on you know on 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 tap and, and be able to see and feel and look and all of that sort of stuff it's also it's also driven the sort of behavior where people go oh my god it's moved 0.001% I better do something about it mm. and so mm. that behavior to be very knee jerk and do something about it um, is if it's done you know in the right way and the right situation and it stops emergencies happening or whatever fine but for the vast majority of time it's overreacting in too quick a time and so yeah. the proverbial tail wags the dog uh, type scenario so if I take a flying parlance we have this thing called pilot induced oscillation so PIOing or porpoising is the other phrase they use. Anybody who's done any flying will know this. So when you look, when you start to learn to have to, in fact, the, the similar would be if anybody drives a car, whenever you get into a spin, one of the reasons why you lose control and then it goes into a spin is that you tend to overcompensate. So as the car starts to move, you try to correct it. But as human beings, we always overcorrect what is required because obviously you're guessing what you need. The same thing with flying. So when you're coming into land, and you're just coming, and of course, everybody wants to try and do a smooth landing. You're going to do an Orion Air type landing or an arrival onto the runway. So, you know, you pull back on the stick, and of course, you pull it too far, it starts going up again. So you go, oh, no, I'm going too high. So you push back down again. So you start going down again. <gasps> I'm going to hit the runway now, and you push back. So you end up with literally this porpoising down the runway. If you ever go to a, uh, an airfield which has got a flying club, and you see these little Cessnas and things flying around, every now and then you'll see this little going down the runway because it is PIOing. And that's because of that knee-jerk reaction. Yeah. So the tail wagging the dog. Yeah, and I, and I wonder also whether a, another issue is that you get this real-time data, etc. You can see how the various parts of your business are performing, but actually, as a consequence of that, you're not spending as you know the C-suite potentially. And I, I don't know whether this is true in your experience. The C-suite isn't spending as much time on the shop floor, so to speak. They're not engaging with their staff potentially as much because they feel that they know everything that's going on in the business, but actually they're not learning about what's going on, you know, within the workforce, I suppose. Is that is that something that you've experienced with, with well, the businesses that you've supported? There's, there's two, there's two parts that because in some ways you could say yes, but in some ways I say no. One of the biggest um, areas that is massively an area, um, I want to say concern, it's an area that has massive room for room for improvement and development, is the fact that predominantly we tend to promote people for technically being very good at their job. Yeah. And so we tend to promote into supervisory management leadership type levels. People are technically good at their jobs, but not necessarily, not 100%, not, but not necessarily the best managers or leaders. 
Yeah. And so one of the problems you find is as people get promoted up, they do what they know best, and that's doing. Rather than what they should be doing as they're getting higher up is to start managing. managing. Mm. And so what you tend to find is a lot of organizations go into, I can find people at senior management level positions and higher who are still doing basic stuff that the troops should be doing. Mm. So in some ways they still know what's going on on, on the shop floor, but they're still hands-on and still doing rather than managing and leading. Yeah. Um, but I can see the argument the other way is if you're up at the top and you should be looking at strategy and all you spend your time doing, you should know that information. You should have some idea, but, but the whole thought I was going is when you first asked that question is it's all great having all that data, but you've then got to be able to portray it, show it, um, whatever in a way that gives you the best means by which you can interpret it. Cause it's like anything else you get a whole shed load of data. You then got to simulate it. So for me as a pilot, when I'm flying around, I've got all my instruments. But not only got instruments, I've got also, you know, I've got a Mark One eyeball, as we used to call it in the Air Force. Um, and you're looking around at the weather, the clouds, where the enemy aircraft are, where your friendlies are, are there any people on the ground that's going to shoot me down? So all that wealth of information is coming into you all the time. So we always talk about A, do you have capacity to enable you to take all the information coming in? Mm. So, for example, if you're if you're driving around in a new car with new new stuff, uh, you know, new um, equipment slightly different to what you used to in your new car, uh, and for some reason, you know, you've um, you've always had uh, um, automatics, and now you've got a, um, a manual, and so you've got to think about changing the gear all the time. And you're driving into town you've never driven before, and it's got a weird traffic system. You know, when you talk about capacity, you are just going, "Oh my God, I just, you know, I just, what's going on?" That sort of stuff. Whereas if you've got spare capacity and all this stuff is coming to you because you're used to a lot of the other stuff, you're used to your car, you're used to driving, it's automatic, all the stuff is being automated, then you've got more capacity free to be able to do a lot more of the applied thinking. Yes. So for us in the military, when we're flying around, we get taught how to do this. We're taught from a young age how to manage all the information that's coming into us. So we learn how to assimilate that information. And so part of that is that trying to build up your own capacity um, which is around training, understanding um, processes that we learn how to do as as humans in, in gathering information. And then go through the whole process of assimilating that information, checking out what things that we need to do, prioritizing and then and then acting on it. And we're constantly doing that on a constant cycle the whole time. Mm. Um, and so, you know, how do we build that capacity in individuals and in teams in organizations? How do we, um, you know, prioritization is a word that, well, actually, no, prioritization is not a word that's used a lot in, uh, in business. Priorities is. And we just log priorities. Well, right, this is the priority this time. Okay. Yeah. Next week. Well, these are the priorities now this week. Okay. The next week. No more priorities. But they haven't got rid of the other priorities. So you end up with some people talk about they've got hundreds of priorities. Well, and then don't get me started on KPIs. People forget what the K stands for. But then, but then, as I say, the, the, the priorities that pile up and up and up and up and the, if you like the to-do list gets bigger and bigger and bigger i suppose that in the medium to long term is detrimental to the company's vision as well uh because you need to be streamlined and you need to give your employees a certain level of certainty in terms of what the future looks like and if you've got 400 priorities that you're trying to work through yeah. I suppose that, that certainty piece is, is some, in some way diluted. And so, well, well the, problems, the problem arises because, A, some companies don't have strategies. Mm. So the whole point of strategy is trying to create a vision of strategy. It's very simplistic. It's just trying to create that North Star, something that people go, this is the way we as a business are roughly going, and this is roughly the plan we want to do it. And then, obviously, as you articulate that, that whole strategy down through an organization, you are then breaking it down into chunks so that each level knows what they're supposed to be doing. Yeah. I refer the point to before, if you haven't got the right people know how to lead and manage, then that becomes harder because they don't know. What people do know is, um, right, you did that last year, so do that again and just add 10% to it. And that's your target, just do that. Yeah. And that's very simplistically the way it's done. So. The problem arises is that what people do is they go, that's a strategy. Okay, right. Okay. I'm in sales. I got that, that. I know very clearly that number's 10 million pounds. Right. I'm just going to go and deliver 10 million pounds. If I deliver 10 million pounds, then I do my business. 
okay, so what about operations? Well, I've got to try and you know provide this service and do all sorts of stuff. And basically, it's about NPS scores, quality. It's about uh, budgets and all sorts of stuff. So I'm not bothered about making money. I just want to try and make as much money as possible. What about inventory, stock, how to store stock? And each of these different people then go off and go, right, I need to deliver on each of these different bits. Mm. So they go off and they don't think about the overall picture you were talking about. All they go off and think is about their own bit. So they go and deliver this, and it's normally measured because of a pound sign, either in a negative or a positive. So they go off. Systemically, what you've created straight away is you've created this silo culture systemically. Mm. Because when they go off and talk to their direct reports and saying, well, I've got to, I've got to deliver 10 million pounds, I've got to sell this much of things, I've got to try and keep this inventory and keep my stock down below a million pounds or wherever it is. Each person will go off and go their own little bit, yeah. do their own little bit against their target. So all they're doing is everybody's just working towards, I've roughly got my, 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 my job is, and I deliver on that. So what happens is cross-functionally, when you try and work cross-functionally and collaboratively, you end up banging your head against a brick wall because each person has got a priority based on their individual thoughts, not on the collective good. And so what you find all the time is there's just competing priorities across the whole organization. So not only have you got levels of management that are not articulating the whole strategy clearly mm. in the right language, you know, you don't have to go to the, the person wrapping up um, pallets uh, out in the, in the um, you know, the delivery yard and whatever and talk to them about gross profit margins and, you know, sectorial, uh, you know, Im Im imperatives into the, into the uh, you know, oceanic regions or whatever. They've got no idea what you're talking about. So all they want to know is if you wrap that pallet up and secure, it doesn't fall off and you keep it so it's watertight, it doesn't get damaged. You are helping us to deliver that. Yes. Because we won't lose the money. It's not damaged. It won't be sent back. That's why it's so important for you to wrap that package securely. Not because it looks pretty and all that sort of stuff, but because of that. That's that's where you're so important to me. You think you are doing one pallet out of the 10,000 pallets we send out every year. So every pallet that gets damaged, that's normally 500 pounds worth of damage. Times that by how much? This is how you can have a direct impact. Yes. Oh, okay. That that's that that's tangible. That's yeah. simple. That's something I get my teeth into. And that's the bit, that, that whole bit of linking everything together is the bit that um, a lot of companies are and, severely lacking. And, and, and tying up that, that, that common purpose bit, I suppose, to the point that if you buy into that common purpose and you understand your position within the common purpose, actually, you know, you will as an individual benefit, right? Because the company will perform better and you know, one hopes at least they'll be remunerated better, et cetera, et cetera. And again, you know, people not being able to see beyond the end of their nose, I yeah. suppose, is is an issue if you don't know what you're working for. Yeah, I mean, I, I come across this quite a lot where there's the sort of, well, I know what my job is. And as long as I do this, my boss is happy. That's all that matters, which is OK to a certain extent. But that that gets you to point A. Yeah. But if you want to get to point B, C or D, where it's about how we collectively can work together to not only, you know, continuous improvement or finding out where the big issues are and solving it. If you don't understand the part you play in the bigger picture, then you do not understand the impact that your uh, either behavior, performance, level of um, accuracy, whatever it is, has on anybody else. So that sort of I'll do it my way because I don't care can potentially create a huge amount of drag in any organization. Mm. And so I come across it so many times between different, you know, um, departments, different uh, teams, different lines, whatever, but they sometimes just don't want to talk to each other because yeah. something's happened in the past as a legacy or whatever. And of course, it's amazing how these things multiply and then they won't talk to each other because they think they're they're liars and they, they don't, you know, they're trying to shaft us and they're always uh, talking us down or whatever. In some places I've been to, it's been horrendous. Um, and the whole point is, as you say, is that Actually, if you understand your impact upline and downline in the way the company works, if you start working with each other and how working out ways of how you can improve it, yes, you may help them do their bit, but also you may help yourself do your bit as well. Yes, yes, yeah. And that's the bit that you're trying to get people to recognize because it's one of the sad things that, that be, it's not only just because people are born because, you know, I'm not, I don't want to help anybody. It's sometimes because 
they've tried and been burnt and that's it they don't want to do anymore so there's sometimes a legacy issue and i get that mm. so there's elements of you know well i'm just going to do what i do and it, uh, what's in it for me so it's the old w i double f uh you know w double i f m what's in it for me so then it becomes a transactional thing yeah and what what we are trying to inculcate into any business it, from it rather than being transactional we want it to be more collaborative yes and yes. so even mm -hmm. simple things like different people in a team or even different teams between other other teams and departments and organization do you actually understand what each other's businesses priorities are mm -hmm. do you understand what each other's challenges are because unless you understand the priorities there's no way you can understand how collectively you can do good moving forward mm -hmm. but then if you don't understand what other businesses challenges are invariably what you find is lots of people are trying to solve challenges but they're the same challenge but there are five or six different parts of the business trying to solve solve it so how much inefficiency is going on there so just to just to sort of uh bring this back to maritime london members i suppose yeah. uh you know the majority of our members work in the professional services which, which serve the shipping industry uh so to speak uh that is a highly incentivized uh and competitive arena i mm -hmm. suppose uh, where in most firms, the majority of the workforce are directly client facing and responsible for their own book. Uh, and, and that is their priority, if you like, against against that backdrop, how do you how do you go about and against that competitive environment? How do you go about building that strong team ethic whilst ensuring that what makes the business successful, which is that competitiveness? if yeah. you like is maintained and, and therein lies a real challenging conundrum yeah. especially for managers and leaders trying to yeah. drive it um it's something that i think ideally needs time with, with what you espouse as any leader of any organization and the sort of culture and values you want to imbue within that but not only with that culture within your organizations it's also the sort of people you want to work with and how you and what you value and what your clients value in what you provide for that so um if you want to make as much money as possible and give people what they need but just done at your terms because you made lots of money out of it fine i mean to me that's probably not the way i want to work and it's probably a you know i always think it's a short term type um a strategy because after a while you'll be found out and people won't like it what people want is to have security. They want to have certainty. They want to be able to know they're going to get good quality. And if things and, and, they, and most most clients accept things always don't go right. But what they want is not somebody saying, well, well, it wasn't our fault. Oh, well, I don't know about that. And oh, I don't know. You know, they want things to happen straight away. They want it solved. They want it look as if it's happening. And it's not anybody whose fault it is. It's just, you know, pro fundamentally pro pro providing good customer service. Yeah. And so in so doing that, providing good customer service, you've got to fully understand what your proposition is, how you're doing it. And also who is responsible for trying to develop that. You know, one of the interesting things is when I go and talk to businesses about their customer journey is that whenever you think about customer journey, a lot of dialogue and a lot of um, content, a lot of um, discussion is always about that interface between the client and the um, uh, client facing person in your business. Well, that's the external side, but you know, that's only going to be 15, 20% of your business has that touch point. Mm. There's another 80% of the business that may not have a direct touch point with your customers, but I'll tell you what, they've got a massive touch point in how you have the ability to be able to deliver for those. Yes. So trying to get people to fully understand that customer service is both an external and an internal challenge. Mm. Mm. And I think, you know, that's probably further amplified by the fact that um, the majority at least of of our members and you know the shipping industry as a whole ha has an international footprint right mm. so so you're you're trying to bring uh, offices and teams around the world along a, a sort of single vision journey uh, which you know can be challenging on a number of perspectives yep. I suppose and I'm sure you've worked with a lot of firms with with an international footprint and yeah, yeah. does that does that represent any or in your experience are there any specific difficulties in terms of building that team ethic in a in a very international setting 
The only difficulty is if people don't fully get to understand the differences that there are. So one of the things I learned very early on from my time, and I'm a big believer in this, is that people make a big thing about culture, and it's culture. The culture's wrong, the culture's this. The culture is what it is. Invariably, it's that you don't fully understand it, and they don't understand you. Mm. So for me, culture is just another symptom of the dynamics and the way people work, not quite working as the way you want it to. It's not as... as um, effective isn't it and and you know it's it's like sand in the in the engine that's not making it to run so i mean i remember doing a, a bit of work with a company which was um, building a big huge uh, water treatment plant in uh, poland and part of the suppliers were from another part of the company was based out of denmark mm -hmm. so you had polish sort of obviously um uh, operators of that business it was a french company so they had a lot of people from HQ were involved in the whole contracting and various things and they had a lot of supplies in from Denmark. So a real pan-European uh, type. And I got called in because the HR for this big, and it's a big massive company, huge, you'd, you'd know exactly who it is. Um, and uh, he said, we have a real cultural problem over here. There's a real, they're all fighting each other and the managers between suppliers and all this sort of stuff. And so I went around a two day workshop with all the senior managers. And what became very clear after a while was a, stereotyping, uncertainty, lack of knowledge, no communication. We spent most of the time just talking about each other, about what they expected from each other. What were, what were your priorities? Yeah. What are your challenges? What are you striving to do? Because yes, there's a Danish supplier, but obviously they have their needs and wants as suppliers of stuff. Yes, there were poles that were running the whole uh, um, um, project and the, uh, and the site, but they had their needs and wants and priorities and challenges. And the same way as the French from the... Um, uh, HQ, they had their needs and wants and priorities and challenges. And in effect, you know, what people were saying is always oh, typically French, you know, they're doing this, always oh, typically Danish because they're doing this. It was like an excuse and a like of an easy way just to say it's that sort of problem. And all it boiled down to was if you just started talking to each other and starting to better understand what are these others' needs and requirements are, what others' priorities and challenges were, what what do we want from this that makes our bit successful, but then to discuss with each other as to how we can make all of these things successful with each other then guess what and by the end of the day we weren't talking about cultural issues we were talking about yeah maybe we're not working as well as yeah. we should be discussing things as well as we should do to try and overcome this mm. and to, to to move on a little bit i mean in sport and everyone will support various sports teams etc everybody knows that you have your superstars in the team uh, yeah. and you have those who you know uh, you're watching Soccer Saturday or reading the newspaper or whatever it might be, those ones who you all know turn up a little bit late for training, aren't as motivated as they should be, etc. And they're the ones that get most of the attention. They seem to get most of the attention from the managerial yeah. point of view uh, and they definitely get most attention from the press, right? Now, but let's say 80% of the squad or the team go largely unsung, but actually it's their performance which ultimately i suppose has a bigger driver in terms of the success of the team yeah. than the the the, the 10 percent of the superstars and the 10 percent who turn up late for training uh, and i suppose that can be transposed into a business setting as well where managers could spend could find themselves spending most of their time with the highest performers and those who need to be built up and looked after to make sure they don't go elsewhere uh, but also those ones who are who are having difficulties where the the incremental gains if you like uh of the 80 percent is what actually is going to make a substantial change to the business 100%. And, and how do you go i mean is is that is that analogy a good one Firstly, I suppose. And secondly, how do you, and this goes back to capacity and time management and prioritization and all the rest of it, but how do you get managers to make sure they're spending enough time with the 80% and not the 10% at either end of the, the you know, uh, horseshoe or however you want to describe it? Yeah, no, I think it's an excellent analogy because obviously I use it. So it's obviously <laughs> brilliant. Um, I use it all the time. Uh, whether using the context of the um, potential performance, um, uh, you know, uh, grid, uh, or I, sometimes I tend to talk about just imagine you're having an SD curve. So the standard Napoleon's hat, um, I, I tend to use 20%. You got a bottom 20% of the poor performers, um, where a lot of managers 
spend a lot of their time, in fact, the business spends a lot of time just managing the fallout from those poor performers down there. The top 20%, they're the, um, the high performers, they'll stuff and you, and you just tend to, you know, keep them happy, you know, preen them, worship them, pay them lots of money, tell them they're, they're wonderful and hope they don't go to the competitor. And you, 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 you spend a lot of time in trying to make them uh, not want to go. But as you say, that middle 60% who are the workhorses, who get no time whatsoever. And I 100% agree with you, you know, if you get the poor performers, poor performers, are you gonna be able to get a 10% improvement out of these people? There is the, potentially one or two people might do because they're in the wrong jobs or various other things, but it's gonna take a lot of hard work. Are you gonna get 10% improvement out of your top performers? Well, te you know, technically speaking, you can't because they're top performers, they're your top performers you shouldn't be able to get 10% out of them because they're at the peak of their performance. That middle 60%, never mind 10% uh, improvement. If you got 1% out of all that lot, you'd move the whole organization massively. Yeah. So the real challenge you've got to do is try and reflect on how much time you're spending in each of those three areas. Mm. There's two things to think about, especially in the poor performers. A, we talked about before that not necessarily the best manager has been promoted. And so you've got a situation where you've got poor managers and poor leaders who are trying to manage the performance of people in an organization. And so they're not as good at being able to manage these people, trying to understand, are they a square peg in a round hole? Um, why are they demotivated? Lack of clarity, we go to this vision and strategy and stuff, if that's not clear, you're not helping them anyway. So there's a, all that huge element of, of process, never mind a capability. You know, again, have they got the right skill sets? Have they got the right ability and nuance of their um, way of working to be able to do the job that you want them to do? Or are they in the wrong job? Yeah. All this sort of stuff. And it requires your managers and leaders to be able to do that. And if that's not done properly, then you're not helping yourself. And you're spending so much time being, you know, stuck in the mud trying to sort this out. Now, you take the Jack Welsh philosophy and just chop the bottom 10% and you can do that. But obviously after a while you can't keep doing it because then you'll just end up with um, real problems. However, yeah. you've got to work out how to manage that. So you've got to reduce it. So from my perspective, I will always, I always think you've got to give people a chance to be able to, you know, because the number of times I've gone into organizations and said, you know, the training, the ability, the capability, et cetera, et cetera, in the business is so poor and it's so easy to blame the individuals. But actually, over time, you learn it's not the individual's fault, 95% of the time. It's the company's fault. It's the system's fault. Mm -hmm. They haven't prepared these people to be, uh, you know, you've heard me talk many times, we talked about this before, about the amount of training that's involved, lack of training, lack of ability, lack of um, synergy, uh, sorry, strategy with, with being being clear with these people. Then the people at the top, you know, people are so frightened of these people at the top. And one of the things you can't count out to this because they some of them, some of them have poor behaviors. Some of them are demonstrating the sort of behaviors you don't really want to that sit with your, your values and your channel and your um, culture. And they come across this all the time when, when I speak to managers and leaders who says, oh yeah, they, you know, he's causing a few problems or she's causing a few problems and roughly a few feathers and yeah, but it's fine. We just manage it over and you know, that sort of stuff. And they just don't realize how bad that small little poisoning that's going on has an impact on us, the business. Mm -hmm. So trying to monitor that. And again, if you're not a good manager and leader, you will just not think of that because as far as you're concerned, that person is delivering the numbers week in, week out, month in, month out. That's the most important thing. So one of the things that you've got to really be careful about is that and really understanding. Yeah. And then you've got to go, okay, why am I not spending more of my time with my middle 60%? Yeah. Now, there may be some of those 60%, that won't improve, but I guarantee you they're the, they're the pack horses that you can rely on. They're the steady, you get, you know what you get out of him. And there's a lot to be said for having people like that in your organization. Mm. You know, it's the whole same old things. If you go and talk to investors and, you know, when they talk about what sort of investment should you have, one of the first things they say to you is varied. Mix your bag, go into different areas, go this, have, you know, I'm saying loosely, don't take my advice, okay, but say, 25% you go as risky as possible. You know, if you don't mind losing that money, just put it on that and it'll make you 100% in a year, but there's a risk you may lose it all. So this stuff over here, 
you basically make 2% every year, but you'll never lose it. And it's guaranteed 2% every year. Yes. At the middle, you take a bit of thing. So you spread it around and yeah. you go into, you know, emerging markets and that's a bit risky or whatever into solid stuff here and all sort of stuff. So with regards to your people and your business, would we like to have, you know, 2000 Cristiano Ronaldo's, uh, Messi's, uh, De Bruyne, all that sort of stuff. In some ways you would, in some ways you wouldn't. Yeah. You know, you, you have a mix across the business. So for, as a business owner, as a business uh, leader, and as managers that are leading this organization, you've got to understand that you're always going to end up with this cross. And never mind, you know, because sport is, is fine. It's just, it's just a 10 year, simplistically, it's a 10 year gap of, of age of certain people who are yes. peak of their performance. Whereas a business, you've got from potentially 16, 17, 18 year olds all the way to past 65, you know, who's still working. So you've got that whole range there and you've got to try and manage that. Never mind around their levels of performance and experience um, yeah. at different levels of the organization. So, so the, we're, we're quickly running out of time, and there's two more things that I want to touch on with you, Rory. So, um, look, you know, I don't think we can discuss team performance uh, and the importance of ethos, et cetera, without talking about uh, the post COVID working environment, I suppose. Um, Obviously, hybrid working for most companies is a reality. Yeah. Uh, you know, the metaphorical water cooler is not as good as the physical water cooler, shall we say. Now, are, are you experiencing companies coming to you saying, we are struggling with hybrid working, our employees are, are demanding it and we understand that and there's been a change and we've got to be accepting of that. However, you know, people, we are seeing more siloed working. We're not seeing the team building. We're not seeing as much interaction and collaboration, etc. And how do you build that in, in the sort of the new reality, if you like, which we're all living through at the moment? Yeah. And of course, it's um, one size doesn't fit all. Yeah, there'll be certain industries where working from home works. I don't have in principle, I don't have a problem with working from home. Mm -hmm. Certain industries where it is tend to be um, people just have to work most of the time just doing what they do. And they have the odd chats. Fine. Fill your boots. Have no problem. But we all know, well, there's straight, things you can do straight away. You have to mechanically, um, physiologically psychologically all have to work together so you know anything to do with construction um, manufacturing all that sort of stuff there's, there's going to be some industries where you have to be in the same space then you've got this it's a bit like what we talked before is that middle bit where there is you have to be in the office and there's that you don't have to be it's this middle bit that causes the big problem yeah um yeah. me personally my passion for teams and and whatever this is a great medium, but as far as I'm concerned, I'm not aware, because obviously you've got thousands of people listening to us here today. But, you know, for me, I'm just having a conversation with you. And that one-on-one -on, -one on, on Team Zooms or whatever you're using, it works brilliantly. It's so much better than what it was pre-COVID when we had um, the other thing, I won't know name it, which was very poor. <laughs> it was work all the time. But now Teams and Zoom and Google Meets and all the different things that you have now, they're light years ahead and, and people got used to it. We were forced to get used to it. Now I'm used to using this. I have no problem using it now. Um, but what I tend to find is obviously if there's a physical reason for you to do stuff, you have to be in. But when it's not physical, the real challenge is how much cognitive type of um, dynamics do you need to do with other people? For me, is one of the elements you have to think about as to reasons why you might want to have people in the same room. Yeah. Or not. Yeah. And I'm not saying no, you shouldn't, but I know that in certain situations, it is so much better for me as a facilitator, especially when I'm going and talking about strategy and talking to, you know, senior teams or whatever, without doubt, I need to have them in the room facing dynamics and the nuances of that, because trying to talk to eight, nine, 10 people on this, when you've got little screens, you don't get the nuances of, mm. of that. And also doing that on like this, you know, uh, you and I will go and have a cup of coffee and, and go, you know, and after an hour of of team meetings and how people do eight, you know, back to back at, at one hour team meetings, I just blows my mind. You know, it's bad enough doing it face to face, never mind on teams. So it's tiring. So 
what all that is saying is that one one size doesn't fit all. Yeah. Really, both sides. And one of the things that does frustrate me a little bit, you know, um, it was very much, yes, we work from home. We've proved that it can work when it needs to. But like anything else, that was an emergency situation. Mm. And an emergency situation, these things happens. And we've seen this, you know, many different formats and ways. But of course, when you get back to normality, which we are now, it's what is best for the company. Yeah. And one of the things you've got to get balanced right is, is it what's right for the individual or right for the business? And there is one of the interesting conundrums you've got to try and have. And I've, I've come across so many different situations. I wondered a situation recently where um, the business said, look, um, we need you to be in, you know, you are in, in this sort of capacity. And it was, I think it was um, uh, support services. I won't say which time, but it was in support services where the dynamics of them being in the office and going around the office uh, in their two locations was, was, was key to them actually being doing their job, mm. um, you know, to the best of their ability. But this person was a mum with kids and it actually suited her to work at home. But in the conversation it's you, she recognised that I needed to be in office at least three, if not four days a week, but it doesn't work for my lifestyle. And so between them, they had to come to a, a, an understanding, well, she recognised that and, you know, she's in the process of trying to find another job somewhere else. So, you know, those sort of uh, sensible sort of type discussions need to be had because, uh, you know, some of the some of the dialogue that you hear sometimes, well, well, it works for me. I think it's brilliant working from home. It, it suits me and it's and it's always me, I, whatever, to the real, you know, um, uh, sort of diehard, I think work from home is the best thing since sliced bread. But of course it detracts from, fine if it works for you, but what is the impact on other people and how they work and how they want to work if they can't have the same access to you um, as they would like to by seeing you wandering around the office. Yeah, and, and actually, it's, I, I, it's trying to get the balance right. I suppose in that balance piece, even there was a there was sort of an implicit bias, even in the way that I asked the question there, in that you know, uh, home working isn't always good, but actually sometimes it's about focusing on the positive in terms of work life balance, in terms of using that time when you're at home to do those things where you don't need a team around you, but also ensuring that your team has a willingness to come into the office and engage with each other, et cetera, when there is that need for, for collaboration yeah. uh, and having, having that flexibility to do that. And I think, you know, again, I'm sure you are having those conversations with businesses yeah. all of the time. The biggest, the biggest challenge they find is managers are finding is that it's bad enough trying to organize people when they're in the same office. Yeah. Never mind when some of people work. Yeah. Oh, but I'm working Monday, Wednesdays and Fridays. Well, I'm doing Monday, Tuesday, Wednesdays. Well, I'm doing Thursdays and the odd Friday. And so, trying to manage when everybody can come together when there's a need to have them actually being face to face there's an added layer of complexity that goes into, goes into it so rory we're we're over time now but um if you've got five minutes uh i want to ask one more one more question of you one more uh, and, and i'm going to be slightly you know i'm going to be slightly cheeky here because i am a big rugby fan as right. you know uh and you know it seems to me that particularly in terms of communication and engagement with your teams, et cetera, yep. uh, top flight rugby could learn some lessons in terms of what we've been discussing today. Um, and, you know, obviously you're, you're not directly involved in the game, but you still take a very keen interest in, yep. in the game. Um, perhaps you could just sort of give a brief appraisal as to, to the current state of, of professional rugby, particularly club rugby uh, in England. Uh, and how you feel some of the, the issues that we're currently experiencing may be resolved to, to, to put the game on a, a more solid footing for the future, perhaps. Yeah, I mean, it's not in a brilliant place for obvious reasons when you see the, the, the news about two teams going bust. Yeah. Um, do I think it's in a terrible place? No, but if things aren't sorted out, it could potentially get there. Yeah. The one thing about it is that, because I was talking about this yesterday at another uh, conference uh, I was speaking at, somebody asked me a similar sort of question. At the end of the day, rugby clubs are still businesses. Yeah. It is still the responsibility of anybody who runs a rugby club to run that business according to, you know, director and fiduciary responsibilities. And so you have to manage the incomings and outgoings of any type of business in the right way. So straight off the bat. So from that perspective, um, there are situations and, and, you know, 
people that run businesses, especially over the last two, three years, they've gotten bust. I have utmost sympathy. I've been through that as a consultant. I've been through the COVID. I've been through the, the cost of living crisis, which we're still going through. And the challenges that brings, I've had sleepless nights. I've had difficult conversations, you know, so I know what it's like. But that doesn't take away from still doing the core underlying fundamentals of how you should run a business. Yeah. And so when you see wasps, um, and it's very difficult to not be, you know, because you know, obviously they were the other end of the M69 from Leicester Tigers. But, you know, when you see the amount of debt they had, um, an ally to all the whole way the game is run, and the fact that how do we keep control of, of the biggest cost to any of this is players' wages. There are so many different parts to it. And people always just point the finger at one thing, but it's it's everything. The RFU, the clubs, the players, the coaches, the owners, the directors, whoever, every single part of that has a part to play in how we move the game forward. Um, and so, you know, there's still rumours now at London Irish uh, and being potentially Newcastle are one of the other two clubs that are even talked now about potentially uh, not getting through. So what's the date today we've got now? I think it's less just under two weeks that London Irish have got to be able yeah. to come up with selling the selling the club. Otherwise, they're going to be in real problems. Um, probably not going to be declared bust, but they may end up having to move down. So all the stuff we've talked about is relevant to any rugby club. The nuances of rugby, it's like any business. I go into businesses that the fundamentals are fundamentally the same, excuse the pun, but the nuances of the business, whether I go into a holiday business or into a, uh, manufacturing business or into service business or whatever, there's slight nuances. Rugby is no different. You could argue it's different because you have this, you know, 90% of any budget is taken up by half, you know, 40% of the, the people that work in the business because yeah. they're all the, the, the rugby players. Um, and they're a dynamic driver of um, inflation within rugby because they, they drive that amount of money you spend. Yeah. And if you want to compete in the Premier League, it's uh, the Premiership, it's one thing. But if you want to compete in um, uh, Europe, it's another thing when you're trying to take on the might of, uh, you know, the, the, the union controlled Irish club uh, provinces and also the French clubs, which are yeah. usually owned by very rich um, owners. And I'm not going to complain about what they do it because that's the way their system works. But without a doubt, it's 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 a question of getting it right. And. You know, is there enough money for, at the moment, 11 teams to spend five, six million pounds to be able to compete with France? Well, the evidence at the moment is probably not. Yeah. yeah. And so the, the question is, do we accept that we have to spend four million each team and our performance comes drops down? We may lose a few England players to, to France and we may not get past the quarterfinals of uh, the European Cup. Yeah. Yeah. Those are all sort of things that people have got to bear in mind. It's not as simple as we'll just drop it under four million. And we'll still expect the club to be able to win the European Cup. Precisely, yeah. Because in sport, money does count. Um, it's like anything else. The one thing I'll say with you, the, the, the time I've been involved in, this, in the game, uh, there ain't one easy solution mm. at all. Because you've got 11 clubs who all have got um, slightly different views of what they think is right. You've got the RFU looking at it from up here. You've got the Premier Rugby that's looking at it from this way. You've got European rugby and then you've got the players in amongst it and various things. Each of these want a bit of the pie. So somehow the only way that's going to be um, sorted out is everybody coming to the table and thrashing it out. Yeah, It's, it's got to be everybody. It can't be just, it's just the, just, you know, there's one report somebody said, it's the players and the clubs have got to sort it out. It's, it's everybody. It's yeah. the only way it's going to happen. And, and, you know, I don't know, but it, it, it feels to me at least that, um a level of consolidation as you say in order to remain competitive against particularly the french and the irish here from a, a european cup perspective but also internationally in terms of how we bring on our, our international players is is possibly inevitable i suppose because because trying to slice the pie too thinly is is not going to achieve those objectives i mm. suppose i think it's you know the difficulty is that premier the Premier League is a big draw for the whole game and sponsorship and advertising and stuff mm. in, in England. Mm. Mm. Whereas the um, United Rugby Championship is not as much. There's not as many crowds go in because not all the teams play all their best players in all the games. They just do enough to be able to qualify and qualify for Europe because Europe is where they get to speak. So 
if you get Munster playing in European thing, they got thousands there, you know, packed, packed to Viva Stadium. But when the, Leinster go and play against Cardiff or um, Benetton Treviso or, or whatever, they put out their second string team. But the way their format has worked, they've got four teams, they've got a big squad, they still put out a good team. And so the real challenge there is, is, is those things have an impact in different ways and it's trying to work how to do that. And of course, it's, it, that's, that's to do with Europe. How the English game sorts itself out, you just you've got to put the Irish, the the other the other countries to one side. You've got mm -hmm. to work out how do we make this work? How do we do? Because there's only a finite amount of money. So how do we deliver that money in a way that is good? And of course, then you have the other thing that comes into it. Then you talk about promotion relegation. Every club aspires to be able to get into the Premiership. So then you've got to take that into account. Mm -hmm. And. Herding, herding cats comes to mind. <laughs> Listen, Rory, we've taken up an awful lot of your time. The sun is streaming into your office now. Is it? Uh, so yeah. probably suggests that you've got, uh, you know, possibly a, a appointment to take your team out to a beer garden or something like that to enjoy the Friday afternoon. Um, last thing from me is, you know, if the, the listeners have found this insightful today and want to understand more, uh, go to your website, etc. Uh, get in contact with you via that way. That is that the best route to to you and to Wingman? Definitely go to my website, uh, which is Wingman Limited Limited Abbreviation dot com. Um, there'll be a, a contact inquiries uh, email address on that, and also uh, link 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 with me on LinkedIn or just message me. Um, that'd be fantastic. Or if anybody wants to send anything to you requesting it, I'm in mean, between you and Olga. We'll send my details out. I'll manage and it. Me. So I appreciate Perfect. that. Thank Lovely. you very much. There's a, Rory, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for your time. I found it really interesting, as always, talking to you, uh, you. and insightful. Uh, and as I say, have a great weekend. Thank you all for listening. Uh, and yeah, if you want to get in contact with with Rory in the future, you know you know where to go. Rory, thanks so much again, uh, and have a great weekend. Thank you, Josh, and you. Cheers then. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.